And the final author talk in our block of programs on gun policy is a discussion of the Second Amendment with David Keene. He's a former head of the NRA and the American Conservative Union. His book is Shall Not Be Infringed, published in 2016. Hello, everyone. Happy Bill of Rights Day. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. For, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am uh, Tom Donnelly. I'm the National Constitution Center's Senior Fellow for Constitutional Studies, and thank you so much for joining us uh, today on this important anniversary. Uh, we have a, a leading voice, our leading defender of the Bill of Rights with us here today, uh, Mr. David Keene. Uh, just to just read a, a, a bit of background. So uh, David's the opinion editor of the Washington Times and former president of the National Rifle Association. Uh, he also served as the chairman of the American Conservative Union. And his new book, which he co-authored with Thomas Mason, uh, is called Shall Not Be Abridged. Fringe, and fringe. Uh, oh. <laughs> they they it, constantly it, it try to is, abridge it. Yeah, you're right. You're, you're totally right. And I'm th I obviously think of the 14th Amendment. Uh, shall not be infringed uh, the new assaults on your Second Amendment. Um, and obviously, Second Amendment can easily shade into contentious political policy debates. This being Bill of Rights Day, I'd like to keep this conversation mm -hmm. on constitutional grounds. Uh, to do that, uh, let's, let's just start with the text of the amendment itself, uh, taking out my trusty National Constitution Center pocket constitution. Uh, the Second Amendment reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, as we already said, you, 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 you borrow uh, part of the text of the amendment for the title of your book. Right. Uh, can you talk a little bit about just that, that, that choice, uh, and we'll take the conversation from Well, here. the wording of the amendment is important, and shall not be infringed is important, because the Second Amendment does not grant the people of the United States the right to keep and bear arms. The amendment says that right shall not be infringed which is a recognition of the fact that the right of self-defense, which is what it really is, uh, pre-exists the American Republic, pre-exists the writing of the Constitution. Of course, many of the states, including Pennsylvania, had in their constitutions prior to the uh, writing of the American Constitution, the adoption of the Bill of Rights, already had an equivalent uh, kind of uh, language in, in, uh, in there, in their, and, and it goes back. The right of self-defense goes back to the Old Testament, to the Talmud, to the, you know, and further back. So that's an important question because these rights, and in the, in the earlier panel they talked about the founders believed in rights that were passed on to them from natural law and God and the like. These were not rights that were being granted by the new government. These were rights, the right uh, to keep and bear arms, the right to, of a free press, the right, the right to speak freely, all of these things were, were rights they believed were inherent in the human condition, which they had to prevent the government from infringing in the case of, of the right to bear arms. So that's why I, that's why I think that part of the lang that part of the amendment and the way it's written is important. Yes, and I mean there is so much uh, vibrant scholarship now around state constitutionalism. Justice right. Alito himself, in his uh, uh, opinion in the McDonald case, you know, relies on some of those state constitutional provisions to argue that you know the individual right to keep and bear arms is 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 uh, uh, deeply embedded in the American Constitution. Right. Tradition. The 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 whole question of the meaning of the Second Amendment uh, was not really studied until relatively recently. It was, uh, there were no decisions on it, there were no court decisions. I went to law school a long time ago, and you would have thought that that one didn't exist. They just passed over it. Uh, we don't need to get to the Tenth Amendment. that didn't exist either. Uh, but it wasn't until relatively recently that uh, people began looking at the history. And of course, in a, in a large sense, uh, Justice Scalia's theory of what the Constitution means and meant had a great bearing on that because that drove people back to the history. Uh, and as they studied the history, they realized that this common sort of sense, this, this common wisdom that the Second Amendment didn't mean much uh, was wrong. And, uh, and as the scholarship developed, I know at one point that uh, the, the uh, folks who wanted a much more restrictive view of the amendment went to uh, Lawrence Tribe at Harvard and he got back to him and said, you know, I'd like to agree with you, I don't like guns, but Unfortunately, the founders didn't. Uh, and that, uh, as we look at this, we realize that it is uh, 
what the Supreme Court eventually said it was in the Heller case. And can you just talk a little bit about, so for, for, for the framers, both you know, at, at the uh, original founding, but also you know, after the Civil War and Reconstruction, um, can you talk a little bit about why, why this value was deemed so fundamental? Why well, it was I, so sort of worthy, worthy of protection? Well, it's, it's sort of in the American DNA. Uh, this is a nation that was founded because the citizens were armed. Uh, we sometimes forget, but that confrontation at the Con Concord Bridge came about because the British decided to confiscate the ammunition. The guns were in private hands, but the ammunition was in the, uh, in the storehouses, and if they could get at the powder, they could essentially disarm the American people. They, that, and that's, that was the, what resulted in the shot heard around the world in the, in the, in the Revolutionary War. So that and the settling of the West, all the things that went on uh, imbued Americans with down deep with a real sense that this is an important part, not just, not just an important part of our history, but an important part of what we are. And the Second Amendment came to symbolize far more than guns, far more than the right of self-defense. It, it, it came to symbolize a certain view of the responsibility of people to defend themselves, their families, their communities, to rely on themselves, not on government. Uh, the NRA, which I headed for two years, was founded after the Civil War. Interestingly, for because the it was founded by uh, several Union uh, officers in New York, because it was their view that the Civil War had lasted two years at least longer than it should have, because Union soldiers weren't very good with firearms. Reason for that was that the Union was recruiting and then later drafting first generation immigrants from Europe in the newly industrialized cities of the North. Uh, and many of these people had no firearms tradition in their, in their they, they couldn't hunt, they didn't have, you know, citizens weren't allowed to have firearms. And uh, in many cases, a Union soldier didn't get a chance to fire a gun until he was in battle. And that's not a good place to learn. So the, the, the saying at the time was that uh, uh, that, a, that a Confederate soldier was the equal of three Union soldiers, but the Union had five soldiers <laughs> you know, for every one of the Confederates. And, the, and so two of the first presidents of the NRA were Phil Sheridan and Ulysses S. Grant of, of the NRA. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was their belief that one, the tradition I was just talking about was being lost because of the, the, the changing population and they wanted to make sure that new Americans, as well as those that had been here for generations, appreciated and understood uh, firearms. And I mean, what, one of the significant features of the, the shift in, in Second Amendment scholarship was, it wasn't just Lawrence Tribe, but it was other uh, professors who were often affiliated with, or, or thought of as, uh, as being more progressive, like Sanford Levinson, like Akil Reed Amar, who will be here sure. later today. Um, and certain, I, I, I'm actually a, a student of both of them from when I was in law school. But <laughs> one, one key feature, too, of uh, Professor Amar's scholarship is sort of rooting the fundamental nature of the individual gun right also in the experience of um, the newly freed slaves um, after well, the Civil War. Yeah, if you go back to the history of gun control as opposed to gun rights, it's come across in several waves. Uh, and the first wave of gun control legislation came about right after the Civil War. It was one thing to free the slaves. It was another thing to give them guns. Uh, and so in the South in particular, there were all of these laws that were established to keep firearms out of the hands of the newly freed black Americans. Uh, and of course, part of the civil rights movement from then on was the, involved with firearms. It's why uh, Condoleezza Rice, our former Secretary of State, was asked about the Second Amendment. And she said, as far as I'm concerned, I'm an absolutist on that question because she remembers hiding under the bed as a child while her neighbors uh, stood on the porch and around her house with shotguns and rifles and the, and the Klan marched. So that was the first wave of uh, gun control legislation. Uh, then we had the, the banning of automatic weapons during the Capone era because of the, the uh, uh, visibility of, uh, of, of the fellows with machine guns. And then we had the crime uh, the, the crime uh, bulge and the riots of the late 60s, which resulted in another wave uh, of, of gun control. And during that whole period, things changed. I mean, the, the attitudes changed because uh, the Second Amendment was not only not mentioned, but uncontroversial uh, up through the 60s. And uh, the NRA reflected that. Uh, 
Hubert Humphrey, John Kennedy, uh, both Roosevelt's, they were all members of the NRA. Uh, the NRA and other gun groups, there were no lobbyists, there, were, there was no disagreement to speak of, but as the, what now become, become known as the cultural wars broke out in the late 60s, uh, all of a sudden there was, uh, uh, there was a, a sh not a shift of opinion, but certainly in the urban areas, a development of opinion that was, it was anti-Second Amendment, anti-firearms, so that you had a situation in which, in 1968, uh, the Johnson administration put through Congress the most restrictive firearms laws ever adopted in this country. It was called the Gun Control Act of 1968. And uh, the polls showed that most people supported gun control. Those were good words. Uh, in uh, a year or so later, after uh, Johnson left office, and incidentally, some of the data, some of the research since then shows that one of the motivators for Johnson was that uh, opposition to the Second Amendment had be, was beginning to become sort of a liberal left m mantra. And that one of his motivating factors was these people were all upset about him, with him because of that war over in Asia. And so I thought maybe this would make him happy. That didn't work, but he tried. Uh, so a year later, Richard Nixon's uh, uh, Secret uh, Attorney General, Elliot Richardson, uh, appointed a commission which then recommended that the Justice Department, Justice Department within 10 years ban the manufacture, sale, or possession of all handguns in the United States. So anybody who was around at that time, and most of your audience is younger than that, so they weren't, uh, but some of us were, uh, if we were asked if by 2015 the Supreme Court would have certified the meaning of the Second Amendment to guarantee the right to keep and bear arms, and if in, for example, in all 50 states, there was some form of a concealed carry law allowing people to, to carry concealed a handgun for their own protection, we would have laughed because uh, we, we at the NRA got into the whole thing because a Democratic, very powerful Democratic congressman who's just retired a few years ago, John Dingell of Michigan, came to us and said, you know, you can train all the people in safety that you want. You can provide people with technical information. You can do all the things that you've been doing for 100 years. It isn't going to matter because nobody's going to have a gun. So unless you step up and defend the Second Amendment, it's not going to mean a thing to anybody. And so that, that sort of changed things in the, uh, in the 1970s. Uh, and since then, everything's been reversed. Uh, so that uh, today, and, and, and those of us who are strong Second Amendment believers, are, uh, uh, we're encouraged by a couple of recent polls uh, during the campaign that the age cohort that is least likely to favor additional restrictions on firearms are the youngest Americans. Hmm. So, in that, in, in, so, so there, there's been a great deal of there are real changes in the way people view these rights uh, and uh, and the Second Amendment. And one of the things it, it's interesting because I, I hadn't thought of this, but since it's Bill of Rights Day. A few years ago, uh, Mitch Daniels, who was then the governor of Indiana and is now president of Purdue, gave a speech in which he said, I believe that more people's attention has been directed to the Bill of Rights by the National Rifle Association than any other group or any other people in the United States because people have turned to it and then they read the whole thing and they get a greater appreciation of the importance of the Constitution because particularly gun owners and people that are Second Amendment friendly, which which uh, comes up to, in our calculations, about 55 million Americans uh, base their belief and their defense of their rights on the Bill of Rights. And that's an important thing, not just for the Second Amendment, for, but for the Constitution, the Bill of Rights generally. Now, just returning to the, the, the text of the amendment, mm -hmm. uh, just, just briefly, I mean, as you, as you know, one, one of the criticisms of sort of uh, the NRAs mm -hmm. or the, the, the gun right community's approach to the amendment is really rooted in the prefatory clause of the right. amendment. And so just to quickly read that, put it on the right. table, love to hear your response to those sorts of arguments. Here's, here's the prefatory clause, <coughs> a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. And the argument is that somehow the, the gun right is then tethered to militia service. So it's very dangerous to take what a word means in 2015 and assume that the word means the same thing in the 1780s. <laughs> Uh, and that, that question was exhaustively researched both by scholars and then addressed by the court. Uh, a, it was the prefatory clause, but B, the militia then meant everybody, meant the people. Uh, and uh, it could have been, it could have just said the, the people. 
the, uh, in, in one sense, the, uh, the logic of, of, of that argument, of the so-called collective rights argument, the argument that uh, was, was made in Heller against the prevailing position was that the Second Amendment does not in any way guarantee that anybody has a right to a firearm for any purpose, that it only guarantees that the states can have a militia. Uh, and uh, it, it, that, made, that made no logical sense historically or, in fact, in a constructive sense. And the sort of mirror language that was used in the states, if the militia was there to protect you from the federal government, why did they want to have a militia before there was a federal government? <laughs> you know, and, and so, the, so what basically happened, and this is where the scholarship changed attitudes, was that this was an argument about words that didn't matter. Uh, in a historic context, whereas the words I suggested earlier do matter. I mean, and this is actually a great time to put both, explicitly put both Heller and McDonald on the table. I mean, the, the, one of the odd things about the Second Amendment, but also... There weren't the, any decisions. Yeah, there were, basically <laughs> weren't any decisions for the first 200 years right. uh, of its existence. I mean, just starting with Heller, can you just give us a little background on sort of who the challengers were, what they were challenging, and very briefly what, what, what the court said there? In essence, the uh, District of Columbia had banned the possession of uh, firearms in any meaningful way for self-defense in the home. Dick Heller, the plaintiff, was a security guard who at work carried a gun. Uh, and lived in a dangerous neighborhood and, and, and sought the right to have a gun in his home to protect himself, and that was turned down. That ultimately went to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and the decision was that the Second Amendment does in fact guarantee, uh, in, in this case protects the right of an, of an American citizen in his home to possess a handgun for self-defense purposes. Uh, and that was the first time that the court had really said that, that it was a fundamental right guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. Uh, and the, the District of Columbia tried to get around that in various ways and failed. But that only applied to federal enclaves, because the District of Columbia, after all, is not a state. Uh, so the second case, which was in some ways even more important, was the McDonald case. And you know, um, and I'm sure some, of, if, if you've some folks here, when you go to law school and you read an appellate case, you know this, you really don't know what the hell it's about. I mean, you, know, <laughs> often, yeah. I mean, you know, about yeah. the, the whole thing. And uh, I sort of got really interested in that kind of thing uh, some years ago when she later, it was part of her book later, but she, uh, Amity Schles had written an article about the Schechter case. Big case that struck down a different NRA <laughs> in yep. back during the uh, uh, Depression. And you would think this was this huge deal if you're reading the appellate case. And then you find out it's about three orthodox butchers in New York who the government says can't allow their customers to pick out their chicken. You know, and you say, well, I mean, it, it, it gives you a whole different perspective on what is this really about to sort of humanize it. So the McDonald case, which was in, in a legal sense, was about whether the Second Amendment right should be incorporated as other parts of the Bill of Rights has so that it would apply to the states as well as the federal government. But what it was about was Otis McDonald. Otis McDonald uh, was a black Chicagoan who at the age of 14, the son of sharecropper parents from Louisiana had migrated north. A, there was a lot of that in, in those days. Uh, he got a job and uh, he didn't have a high school education. He got a job as a janitor. Uh, he went off to the war, fought in the war, came back, got married, bought a decent house, got his GED, eventually uh, became head of his, the janitorial union in the public schools locally. Uh, his kids were grown, his wife had died, and uh, his neighborhood, which had been a pretty decent neighborhood when he bought the house in the 1950s, became the home of gangbangers and drug dealers. Uh, and uh, so he applied to the city of Chicago for the right to keep a gun to protect himself, and they turned him down. Uh, and he took that to the Supreme Court. And he said he took it to this because he was also a student of history. He said he went to the Supreme Court because of his right and the right of other people in Chicago, but also because he knew where those laws came from. Uh, and so he said when he sat in that courtroom, as it was argued before the Supreme Court, he thought he was a representative of those people after the Civil War who were told they couldn't defend themselves either. And of course, the court uh, found that incorporated it. There was a big dispute about what, what 
what course to take, and that, that really doesn't isn't relevant here. Uh, but once that happened, uh, the uh, the right became live, uh, and I liken it to you know the um, First Amendment in 1920, the right to speak, free speech mm -hmm. portion of the First Amendment. We knew that it existed, but it, as you know, there weren't many court decisions uh, up to that point. So you knew that uh, that the Bill of Rights guaranteed the right to free speech, but what did that mean? Because as the as Justice Scalia noted in, in Heller, every fundamental right is subject to reasonable restrictions. So in the case of free speech, we know the you know the sort of outlandish extreme example. You, you know, just because you have the right to free speech doesn't mean you can hire, you can yell, fire in a crowded theater. But there were a hundred cases that had to work their way through the courts. Can they license your speech? Can, can they restrict where you can speak? Are there all the things that went on. The Second Amendment today is where the First Amendment was in the 1920s, because the court has said, okay, it's a fundamental right. Now what? What does that mean? And, it's gonna, and there are cases now winding their way through the courts uh, that will lay out the parameters of what is and is not allowed in terms of reasonable restrictions on that fundamental right. One of the problems that we face legally is that in the Heller case, uh, it was a ban complete ban. So the court didn't have to specifically, although some would argue it didn't have to specifically, address the question of what level of scrutiny courts had to apply to restrictions on that right. Because I say maybe they shouldn't have had to because in the case of fundamental rights, which they declared that it was, the courts are supposed to look at restrictions with what we call strict scrutiny. Since Heller, because they didn't have to answer that question, some of the lower courts in different parts of the country say, well, they never said we had to do that, so we're not going to do it. So you've already got, for example, uh, cases, the, the two kinds of cases that I can mention are one, uh, the so-called assault weapons ban, basically the ban on the semi-automatic AR-15. Some jurisdictions have said that's reasonable and others have said it's unconstitutional. Uh, the other is the question of what are now known as, as, as uh, uh, may issue states on the concealed carry permits. There are three kinds of, of the way the courts and the states look at the right to carry a firearm concealed for self-protection. There are what they call constitutional carry states. Those are, there are 11 of those. It used to just be Arizona and uh, Vermont, which is a state filled with armed socialists. Um, and, uh, and, and that that view is that if you are not a prohibited person, if you're not a felon, you're a felon and all, there's a list of people who are not allowed to have mm -hmm. firearms. If you're not on that list, if you're not one of those people, then you can carry a gun. You don't have to get a permit. Uh, most states are what they call shall issue states. And the shall issue states are states in which if you apply for a permit to carry a firearm, the sheriff, who in most states makes the decision, if they don't want to grant it, they have to give a reason. In other words, the burdens on the government mm -hmm. to tell you you can't exercise the right. In May issue states, the burden is on you to demonstrate to the government that you ought to be able to carry the gun. And they don't have to prove anything, so they can just deny it. Usually what happens is that if you're a friend of the sheriff, you get a gun. Or if you're in New York and you're a billionaire, you get a gun. And if you're not, you're not you don't get one. So the legal argument there is what gives the government the right to force a citizen to try to prove that the citizen has a right to exercise a right guaranteed by the Constitution. Well, their courts have come down differently on those things now. So this is going to take a long time uh, for the courts to, uh, uh, the courts to, to sort of straighten out. Uh, in, in Maryland, uh, fortunately, the governor backed off on a little bit of it, although they passed a strict gun <coughs> control packages. Uh, the governor added on so the price of a handgun would go to something like, there'd be an additional $500 or so on buying one. And he backed off because the, uh, uh, the legislators from the minority counties went to him and said, oh, now we get it. <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is a case where you think people that live in Montgomery County, or the wealthy county, who can afford this can protect themselves, but we can't. And they forced him to back off. But that's similar to speech restrictions in some ways. In other words, what kind of attacks can you put on a right until it becomes an infringement on that right? 
Now, just to really put some 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 meat on the bones of, of the sorts of the, the, sort of the comparing the two different analyses that lower mm -hmm. courts may make here, strict scrutiny versus something less than that. Let's take the assault weapon, an assault weapons right. ban, because that's probably the most familiar. Can you just give a sense of how, if you apply strict scrutiny, what the analysis looks like versus what a more permissive yeah, standard looks like? Actually, it is even more than that, because uh, if you read the Heller decision, uh, there is a, a paragraph in it which uh, I have to believe, though I don't know this, that uh, Justice Scalia and the others said they tried this once, let's just tell them what they can and can't do. So in saying that you can have reasonable restrictions, they said there's one thing you cannot do. You cannot restrict or ban a firearm that's uh, widely owned and commonly used for legal purposes. And, and uh, about five million people own AR-15s. The, the AR-15, which is a semi-automatic, not an automatic weapon, uh, is uh, owned by about five million Americans. It's the most used firearm now for competition. It's the most used for, for uh, long gun rifle training, it's used for hunting, for predator hunting. It's illegal in some states because it's too small uh, a caliber for deer. Uh, and so it's, it can't be used for that. But it, and it's also used widely for self-defense purposes in the home. So the court was saying, you can't do that. Under strict scrutiny, you would then have to take a, take a case uh, like uh, uh, the concealed carry law. If I said I wanted to deny you, and you challenge this uh, in a May issue state, if, I, if the courts look at that with strict scrutiny, they'd have to say, is that, does that accomplish a state, a legitimate purpose? Was there another way to accomplish that? And why does this work? Uh, in Virginia, uh, this was the legislature stood up and stopped it. But in Virginia last year, the attorney general decided by executive order or regulation that Virginia would no longer recognize the concealed carry permits of people that are issued in 25 other states, which would have affected about 6 million people that travel through Virginia. And a Washington Post reporter asked him at the press conference, Mr. Attorney General, can you name one law, one crime? that would have been prevented had this been in effect before, or one crime that you think will be prevented because you're adopting. He said, no, I can't, but that's not the point. Well, if you're looking at that from a strict scrutiny point of view, you'd say, oh, but that is the point. Uh, and that's where, that's where you get into it. So you'd have to look at it. The fact is that um, uh, take going back to the so-called assault weapons. Assault weapons are a military weapon that uh, can that can be used selectively and, f and be fired fully automatically. So these guns are not assault weapons. Uh, these guns are civilian semi-automatic versions that look like the the fully automatic. And one of the reasons is that my daughter, for example, uh, spent 10 years in the army. She did two tours of Iraq and one of Afghanistan. She owns one gun. It's an AR-15 because the fully automatic military version was something she relied on to protect her and to save her life while she was in the, in the military. And now as a civilian in her home, she's got a semi-automatic version of that. And she also knows it, loves to shoot it. Historically, the best selling, the most used civilian guns at any stage of firearms development are something that, that are adopted by people who've served in the military. So that's the reason for that. But Going back to if you're looking at it with, with strict scrutiny, you'd say, now are a lot of people killed with these guns? And the answer is no. In fact, according to the FBI, each year more people are beaten to death in this country than are killed by all long arms, shotguns, rifles, assault weapons, the whole thing. So they'd say, now, is banning this for all these people accomplish a real purpose? And, and if you're looking at it with strict scrutiny, the court might say, mm, no, it doesn't. So that's, I mean, but those questions, they become empirical questions in many ways when you're really looking at it that way. You can't just say it's a good idea. Uh, you have to be able to prove it is. And one of the reasons that the uh, pro-Second Amendment people have won most of these debates uh, is that the evidence is not there in terms of most of the proposed restrictions. There's, there's no, no real evidence that that would do any good. And if you're a, if you're a federal judge, with a body of law and you're required to use strict scrutiny, the fact that you can't prove that it would accomplish anything is a reason not to find it constitutional. And, and just to sort of test the, the, the bounds of the Second Amendment right. a bit more, let, let's just tick through a couple of other mm -hmm. you know, traditional uh, policy approaches. One being, you know, what sort of, 
in, in your view, constraints does the Constitution make on um, the government's ability to ban certain, uh, you know, prohibited purchasers of, uh, of firearms? For instance, uh, violent felons. But you know, uh, well, where, where does where does there's that, where an does entire that list yeah. uh, of people who are prohibited? The biggest gun seller in the United States is Walmart. Uh, unusual, but I guess they sell most of everything else too. So why wouldn't they be the biggest gun seller? Uh, most people, in their first firearm, particularly, they buy it at a Walmart or someplace like that, and uh, they undergo a background check. There is a list of 10, 12, 13 categories of people who are not allowed to purchase a firearm. The most obvious one is somebody that ha is a felony, who has been convicted of a felony, is denied their firearms rights for life. Uh, anybody who's been adjudicated to be mentally potentially dangerous is not allowed uh, to, to purchase a firearm. They've tried to ex expand this in many ways so that now they've got some misdemeanor cases and the like. And my only problem, in fact, I, uh, I, I met with the group called the Prosecutors, uh, Prosecutors Against Gun Violence that's headed by Cy Vance, the DA in New York. and. Uh, and the, the, the folks, the Bloomberg people came uh, to this meeting and said that, uh, did I think there were circumstances under which you could either permanently or temporarily ban someone from owning a gun? I said, yes, we do. And they said, okay, well, we'd like to ban guns uh, for anybody that's picked up for DWI. And I said, well, do you have empirical evidence to suggest that if somebody had one beer too many, he's gonna shoot up a mall? Well, no, but it'd be a good idea. Well, the problem is that we have always been against treating people as members of groups. Uh, and so, as an example, going to the, 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 the prohibited people that, that are, are uh, prohibited on mental grounds. Uh, during the Clinton administration, uh, there was an attempt to put a lifetime ban on any military person who had ever had counseling, which from a practical standpoint would mean you're not gonna to go to counseling. Mm -hmm. um, but from a broader perspective, we thought it was depriving somebody of a constitutional right without due process. So the NRA went to Congress and got that restricted. Uh, in most cases, we've supported some things, whether it's in, we, the two things we like or the two things we require are that it be uh, individually centered and that there be due process. So for example, some years ago when Colorado adopted a concealed carry law, uh, in most states the, the decision is made by the sheriff of the county uh, on the grounds, the historical grounds that he's got a better understanding of what's going on than, than others. Uh, we supported what became known as the naked man rule. And it was thus named because uh, you know, the hypothetical was that the sheriff gets an application from a fellow who's never been adjudicated mentally at all, but is sitting on the courthouse lawn naked wearing a tinfoil hat and talking to Martians. He might want to decide that maybe I shouldn't give this guy a gun. Well, then the law requires that he's got, that the, that the guy has the right within 48 hours to go before a board and demonstrate that he does have the right. Well, that, seems, that seemed to us to be a reasonable kind of thing. If there's an individual who is exhibiting some potential for dangerousness, you might want to take a look at them. But to simply say that anybody who's had psychological counseling or anybody who, most, most of the mentally ill, there's a very small percentage who are dangerous, uh, but most of the mentally ill are more, as likely to be victims of crime as perpetrators of it. So we like to look at these, we, we think what you need to do with a fundamental right is apply it not to groups, but to individuals. And you know, one of the problems we've always had in this country, frankly, is we've always tried in one way or another to predict who's gonna be the bad guy. You know, so gee, it's poor people, it's black people. It's, uh, in the 70s it was, um, there was a uh, criminal chromosome that was the, was the rage for a while, the XYY chromosome. And that they, you could identify people when they were children who were likely to be violators of the law when they grew up, and fortunately, there were physical uh, characteristics, red hair and freckles. My reaction was, well, there go the Irish. Trouble. We got rid of the poor, the black, now the Irish, you yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and so y you can't do it that way. Not if you're dealing with fundamental rights of the American people. You have to have due process. Uh, 
uh, and you have to deal with individuals. Uh, I had this conversation with uh, Mr. Vance when we were doing this, because I, I, I said that, and he said, I, well, we sort of agree, we agree with that. And I said, for example, even in the most, even in the most, uh, the, the clear, what looks to be the clearest uh, case where you should be a prohibited person, that's a felon. Now, obviously, if you're a gangbanger, you've used a gun, you've done all these things, I think a ban of firearms for life makes some sense. But what about a five foot six accountant who in 1970 embezzled money from a Christmas card company? Is that a dangerous individual? Well, we don't get into that question because then they'd say, well, the NRA defends criminals. But the same question arises. The real question is dangerousness. And when you're dealing with a fundamental right, you don't want to take those rights away from people who don't, who, who are not and don't have a, aren't, aren't likely to abuse them in a dangerous way. And what about something like uh, background checks before purchasing? What sort of what sort of bounds might the Constitution place well, on, on those sorts of? Well, you things? have you undergo a background check if you if you buy a gun. You know, in the in the in the uh, after the 1968 uh, Gun Control Act was passed, there were no definitions of anything, uh, and so it was really up to prosecutors to decide who were dealers and who weren't and who was doing it illegal. Illegally, and there were a lot of there were prosecutions of people who gave guns to their grandchildren, pro gun collectors, mostly in those days. And finally, the Senate, uh, actually, when Birch By from Indiana was the chairman of the committee, took a couple of weeks and said, "Who do we? What is it that we're trying to accomplish here?" And they came up with the current rules. Uh, and then in 1994, uh, we asked for the NRA asked for two things. One was that uh, there'd be an instant check system developed. It took some years to do that. So that today, if you go to buy a gun from a dealer, they dial a number, uh, and your name is run through all the databases by the FBI. And then within, sometimes within seconds, sometimes within minutes, it comes back and says, he can get a gun or he can't. Uh, and, and then the law requires that if you were approved for purchase, that those records have to be destroyed. And uh, uh, in, in fact, that was put into the law, and then we had to go to court because, of course, the Justice Department said, well, we were, we're not really going to do that. <laughs> you know? And so we had to go back to court to get them to do it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that works. And we also, incidentally, had during the Clinton administration, then had to go get funding for the program because the, the, the government decided, well, if they have to be approved through the system and we don't fund the system, then they can't buy a gun. <laughs> You know, so after after compromising to get something that worked, we then had to go back uh, and 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 do it again, and uh, so so now most pe most guns are purchased uh, uh, with a background check. If you if I if you sell me a gun, and we know each other, and you have no reason to believe I'm a prohibited person, then there's no need for a background check. Just as if you sell me sell me your car or whatever. If you have reason to suspect that I may be prohibited, then you may be committing a crime if you do that. But there aren't that many of those. And the, you came up with this whole, th and a lot of these things are mythical, this is like the gun show loophole. Uh, well, the, nobody knows the exact number, but the number of guns that are sold at gun shows that don't have background checks are probably in the single digits in terms of the percentage. Most of the exhibitors have firearms license. Most of the purchasers are people, if they don't know them, they'll get them. And you know, back in the, in the 90s when this first came up, uh, we observed that most gun shows today are done by, are put together around the country by four or five different companies. I mean, there are people that organize them like they organize county fairs or whatever. And it's perfectly legal under the law at the time for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms to go to the organizers and say, well, you know, here's, here's the deal. We'd like to have a table with a phone uh, at your show, and you should require anybody that comes to the show, whether it's private or not, have a background check. And BATF said, well, we're not going to do that. <laughs> you know? So now, if you go to a gun show in Virginia, the state police have a thing that says, if you have any suspicions, for five bucks, we'll do the background check, because you can't do it, I can't do it, because there are privacy laws. So it's, it's a, these are essentially mythological threats. Uh, during, the, during what we call our gunfight with when I was president of the NRA with the Obama administration, I was invited to the um, 
the uh, Christian Science Monitor Breakfast, used to be known as the Sperling Breakfast in Washington. It's a, maybe 50 or 60 print broadcast reporters, and they have a guest there that they harangue or <laughs> ask questions. So I was, the, uh, I was to be put on the spit one morning, uh, and somebody brought up the uh, question of the gun show loophole. And I said, I have a question for all of you. How many people at this table, how many of you reporters who write about this have ever been to a gun show? Nobody raised their hand. So I said, OK, it just happens that next weekend in uh, Virginia, just outside Washington, is going to be the largest gun show in this region. So the editor of the, of the Monitor will pass around a sign-up sheet, and I will host you. I'll take you there so you can look at this. And then if you want, we can go to the NRA, and you can do whatever you want there. So th that way, you'll know what you're writing about. And the poor guy called me Wednesday of the next week, and he said, nobody signed up. My reaction was, well, why would you want to know about something you were reporting on? You know, <laughs> you know so it's, it, what we have is really a uh, non-evidence-based sort of um, almost religious uh, feeling about if society would be better if there weren't guns. So I mean, John Bolton did the uh, forward to our book. And he said it's sort of the analog of the people who thought in the 60s the internet, internationally where if we, if we just disarmed, the world would be a great place. And other people wouldn't be threatened by us, and then there'd be no war. And uh, that didn't really work. And, but there are people who almost quasi-religiously believe that if they could snap their fingers and firearms would disappear, there'd be no more robberies, there'd be no rapes, there'd no, be no home break-ins and the like. And, and folks like that are not really not really moved by evidence. And that, that's part of the problem. And going to your general question about what can be done, uh, it is um, the nature of that battle makes it almost impossible to discuss anything reasonable, uh, like the, the naked man rule and, th and things like that. There are, I mean, there are things that can be done. The mental health system is one of the major problems that we have in this country. It's a, we overreact to everything, you know. So there are abuses in the mental health system in the 50s and 60s and 70s. So what did we do? We abolished it. And now those people live on the streets. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of things. There are things that you can do, uh, but uh, they're not really often discussed. Thanks for that. Uh Thank you so much for questions from the audience here. We're going to... I was not filibustering. I just talked too much. <laughs> no, not, not at all. <laughs> so here, here, here are some, some questions from the audience, and I'll sprinkle some of my own, my own in as, as, as we, we continue to go along. First one, uh, uh, you have put the word militia in historical context. Will you do the same uh, with the term uh, well-regulated? Well, that meant well-trained. That meant people that understood. One of the functions of the NRA, for example, after its founding in the 1870s, was to provide safety training uh, and uh, hunter training and, and uh, competitions so that people would be proficient. They would be well-regulated in the way they use their firearms. That's, that's what that meant. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's what it, we don't use the same words, but it's what we mean today. You don't want... Uh, you know, we, we spend most of our, it's, it's interesting because uh, this is, goes to the mission of the NRA, if I can, for a second. Uh, if you ask somebody on the street, or I dare say if you ask anybody in this audience, most of you would say, what is, what's the NRA? It's the, it's the group that, it's a political group that fights for firearms rights. You know, that's fine, and that's, since the, since the 1970s, we've done that. But we spend, even today, about, eight or nine percent of our budget on that. The rest of the money that we raise and which our members benefit our members is safety training, firearms training. We run comp competitive matches, the National Police Championships in Al Albuquerque, all these kinds of things, which is the historic mission of the NRA. I dare say if there are some people in the, in the audience uh, my age who uh, started uh, hunting or were Boy Scouts back when they were in their uh, younger days, probably got their training uh, from the NRA. We've got something like 70,000 certified trainers in the country, a program which began because I, I, we're now in a new century, so a couple centuries, the turn of the previous century, the Boy Scouts had a merit badge for shooting, didn't know what that meant. So they came to the NRA and asked us if we'd set up the standards for them, and that's where our training, our certified training program. But, but that. We think that we think that pe people who 
purchase and use firearms should do so safely and they should know what they're doing. And that's, that's part of the overall mission of the, of the organization. Excellent. So here's, a, here's another question. Uh, if the right to bear arms is a natural right, uh, why is it not valued today in the same way by other democracies like the UK, France, or Germany? Well, most countries, in fact, and this goes to the UN Treaty and the UN itself, deny that there is any right to self-defense, whether it's with a gun or any other purpose. Uh, not every country takes that position, but that is the position of the United Nations. It is the position of Australia or Germany or Britain. Uh, in, in Britain, if, uh, if you have a gun, if you have one legally for some reason, there's not very many, but maybe a shotgun, and somebody there's a home invasion and you use that gun to protect your family, you're the one who goes to prison because that right does not exist. Uh, under the current laws in those countries. Uh, that right has existed um, throughout history in the world. In fact, I, I've got to fly down uh, uh, after I leave here to Florida because I'm speaking to 800 principals of Orthodox Jewish schools uh, about school protection because one of the things that we've developed is training uh, and ways to assess the vulnerabilities of schools and what you can do with and without firearms. Some schools use firearms, some don't. Uh, and I was just, because of the group I was talking to, I was looking back in the, in the Old Testament, uh, the right, in fact, the Old Testament has what, what we would call the castle doctrine. Uh, if a burglar broke into your house at night, you had the right to kill him. Uh, if you, had the, you had an obligation to defend your family. Well, Americans still believe that. Uh, a lot of countries don't. Here's another. Uh, do you the agree? short answer oh, is we're right and they're wrong. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you agree that any gun regulation leads to a slippery slope to banning guns? And the second part is why should individuals have a right to possess assault weapons? Well, I mean, individuals don't have a right to uh, possess assault weapons. Uh, uh, fully automatic weapons have been restricted. Uh, in this country since the 1930s. Uh, it, you can, you, it's, it's not fair to say that you can't get one, but I can tell you this, that the license that you need, the tax you have to pay, and the background check that you have to undergo is far greater than any of the people that are gonna go to work in the Trump administration. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, and, and then, because it's been illegal to s manufacture assault weapons in this country for, uh, since the 1960s, uh, a machine gun uh, that you purchase is going to cost you up, upwards of twenty to thirty thousand dollars, or maybe a hundred thousand dollars. So some years ago, the late Frank Lautenberg uh, from New Jersey, who had claimed that the NRA was facilitating the sale of machine guns at gun shows to terrorists, uh, decided that there needed to be a law against this, and uh, they took up an entire day of debate in the United States Senate. And actually, the NRA didn't do the research. Some enter there, there still are enterprising reporters in this country did a piece in which he said that he'd researched the question and Mr. Lautenberg was really onto something because since 1939, two people have been killed in this country, uh, one by a gun collector and one by a policeman with, machine, with legally acquired machine guns. You can't buy an assault weapon. You can buy a semi-automatic AR-15 which if you don't know the difference might look to somebody like an assault weapon because they think it's ugly. Most people who have them don't think they're ugly. So that, that's the, that, that question is, that was the second part of the mm -hmm. question. What was the first part, oh, I'm sorry. No problem. Uh, do you agree that any gun regulation leads to a slippery slope to banning guns? Well, that's the ultimate goal. This year, uh, and usually the, the folks who want what the president calls common sense gun restrictions says he's a believer in the Second Amendment. He would never ban guns. He ran ads in the 2012 campaign saying, I will never, never take your gun, I'll never take your pistol, I'll never take your shotgun. This year, the president of the United States and Mrs. Clinton said that there were two models in their mind for how to deal with guns in a common sense way. Great Britain and Australia. In Australia, and Mrs. Clinton cited the fact that Australia had what we call a gun buyback program. We tried that in a couple of cities here. Difference was that we did it on a voluntary basis. In Australia, 
uh, it was a mandatory basis, and the ads were very simple. They said, uh, refuse to turn in your gun, go to prison. Then the government bought an ad, a full-page ad in the Australian newspapers. And this is Mrs. Clinton's idea of a common sense way to go about regulating guns, although she may not have seen the ad. They bought full-page ads of three people naked, from the, but there's a picture from the waist up, tied to showers, which were obviously supposed to be prison showers. And it said, if you don't turn in your gun, this can be your future. I would say that those that people who hold that up as the model of how they ought to deal with firearms in this country, in fact, want to abolish firearms. Uh, does every, every uh, reasonable restriction on, on firearms result in that? No. But what has to be realized is that there are a lot of people who would like to accomplish that. So people who believe in the Second Amendment have to be very cautious about it. When the Gun Control Act of 1968 passed, Ted Kennedy said this is a great first step on the way to abolishing firearms in this country. Was he ready to do that? Did that do it? No. Is, is, there, a, is there a path from step one, step two, to step three, four, and ten? Yes, there is a path. Will they be able to go down that path? We hope not. And, uh, and actually, uh, far more people today support the Second Amendment that did in the 1960s, 1970s, or 1980s. Uh, Eric Holder had said, not during his incarnation as Attorney General, but during the Clinton administration when he was Deputy Attorney General, had given a speech in which he said, our goal has to be to demonize guns in the way we did cigarettes. We have to make it culturally unacceptable for anybody to own a firearm. Then we'll be able to get rid of them. Uh, well, what he's learned since is that guns aren't cigarettes, uh, and in fact, between then and now, more people are buying firearms, more people are using them. Uh, the biggest group of people buying guns today are women. Uh, I, and uh, and uh, that's the biggest growth of the NRA, for example. It's the biggest growth in competition. Uh, I, I used to say if a couple of years, it didn't happen until a few years ago, those manufacturers aren't making pink guns because they like pink. They're making them because they know their customers. Now, we're, we're running out of time here, and I'd like to have just a chance to project ahead a little bit. We've talked a lot about the past, but obviously we just had an election. We have a, a new president, um, and, and one of his first tasks will be uh, naming a replacement for Justice Antonin Scalia on the Supreme Court. But let's, let's project ahead, say, 20 years. Imagine it, it, it's 2036. Um, president Donald Trump has a chance to, let's say, appoint three to four new conservative justices to well, the court. Well, appointing, appointing one won't do it uh, because, the, as I said, the question is what kinds of restrictions will be found to be reasonable by the court. Uh, and uh, one, whoever the president appoints is not going to be Antonin Scalia, uh, who had the advantage not only of, a, of, from my perspective, a solid view of the Constitution, but was an amazingly engaging guy uh, and was able to put together and convince others. Uh, there are others on the court who might have voted, Anthony Kennedy, for example, might have voted and did vote with the majority in Heller, but not, might not do the same on some of these other, other questions. Uh, so uh, the first appointment protects what's already been done. This, the second appointment will determine the outcome of a lot of those cases that we talked about earlier once they reach the court. And I fully expect that there will be more than one appointment, and that uh, and that uh, that that'll happen. So if so, I think that it, at some point we get a court that says you have to employ strict scrutiny in looking at these uh, restrictions on fundamental rights. That would be the court goal. But a lot of these decisions are going to be made by the lower courts, so those appointments are also important. And the real questions are going to the the real. Uh, fight on these questions is going to take place in the state courts. That's, those are the people that do the regulation. Congress is not going to adopt any of these things. That's not going to happen. So that's, that's, where, that's where I would, would see that, that situation. And then if, if, just briefly, I mean, if, if, if uh, strict scrutiny ends up applying in this situation, what, what existing uh, regulations do you see perhaps falling by the wayside? Uh, the, well, I, I could see, you know, yeah, it's a you total, don't know. Total, no, no, okay. I, no, I totally understand <laughs> you know, that with that caveat. I mean, in a vain appointed mind. six justices, you still wouldn't yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, but I would think that the challenge to uh, 
uh, may issue states on concealed carry could be at risk uh, from, the, from the standpoint of those states. Uh, I think the jurisdictions that have found it reasonable to ban the AR-15 will find that the other jurisdictions would be upheld where they can't do that. Uh, most of the existing uh, regulation, I, I had an inch, I, I, I spent a lot of time talking to law school classes and sometimes law students think more clearly than, than uh, we do. And uh, I, I, uh, actually a court that he appoints might be less likely to do this, but uh, uh, I was addressing a Georgetown class not too long ago and one of the students, a black female student said, let me just ask you, if this is a fundamental right, and uh, most of the anti-gun legislation and le or laws are imposed by cities that are primarily occupied by minorities. And if those minorities are in fact the most at-risk people, uh, you know, pr to, from criminals, and they can't protect themselves like uh, Mr. McDonald, then under disparate impact, aren't those laws unconstitutional in those cities? I never thought of it that way. It's a creative but, argument. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a creative argument. So you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but I suspect uh, the, the, the sort of battle over guns is not going to end uh, because both sides feel strongly. Uh, I do think that uh, as, they, as, as, as it becomes clear, if the court makes it clear that the Second Amendment is not going away and it's not going to be rewritten to allow you to do every, anything you want, that there, can be, there could be a place where you can start discussing what's reasonable. Uh, and that would be a healthy development rather than an unhealthy development. There's still going to be other things. Uh, uh, Mr. Bloomberg and his friends spend a lot of money. Uh, in the, not, I don't know what he spent this year, but in the previous cycle, he spent, in the off-year elections, he spent $60 million uh, and uh, has tried to come up with other creative ways to, uh, uh, to, to sort of go after the Second Amendment. So you're going to have that. You're still going to have the, uh, the machinations at the United Nations, although the current treaty which was signed under the Obama administration and sent to the Senate last Friday is not going to be ratified. Uh, it, it, the Senate could do two things. It could, because uh, as you know, treaties live in perpetuity. And we're still arguing about the law of the Sea Treaty that was negotiated in the 1970s. Uh, so uh, the Senate could bring it up, vote it down, and thus drive a stake through its heart. Or they could, or the new president could withdraw the American signature from the treaty. Uh, but there are all kinds of international things. For example, under that treaty, and uh, it is um, even if you don't sign it, uh, the one of the re one of the requirements, if they could ever actually enforce it, is that a signatory is not allowed to ship firearms to a country that's that's uh, seen as a uh, human rights abuser. The UN Commission on human rights has taken the position that a country that allows citizens to own firearms is a human rights abuser. So technically, it's conceivable under the treaty that the countries that produce a lot of the finest sporting arms in the world, Turkey, uh, Spain, Italy, uh, Germany, uh, would not be allowed to, you know, or could be, it could be argued that they shouldn't be shipping firearms to hunters and shooters in the United States because we're uh, a bad bad guy in terms of the UN. So the, 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 there are all kinds of things. We now there's a there's now a group of uh, 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 big law firms that some, some of their partners are getting together to say, can't aren't there ways we can find ways to around this and we can sue all these people? Um, you know that's where that was the big controversy with um, between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, as you'll recall, during the presidential thing, because Bernie Sanders had uh, had voted not to allow uh, lawsuits against gun companies that, that were not for manufacturing bad products or anything like that, but to say that guns were bad. And, he, and they never expected to win those, but they expected to break the companies. Uh, and I think they're looking at that, again, as a way to do it. Because when you hear this this talk, I mean, the uh, somebody said, well, aren't they Maybe these lawyers are, are like the cigarette lawyers. I say, well, the difference is the cigarette companies had money. The American gun companies, are, I don't know how many times Winchester's gone bankrupt, but these are companies that uh, they have big names and much smaller 
capacity and much smaller uh, purses from which you can, can get money. Excellent. Well, for those of you hungry for more information about the Second Amendment, a shameless plug to check out uh, National Constitution Center's <laughs> Interactive Constitution at constitutioncenter.org. It's a short one, so you can... Yeah, no, <laughs> but, but, but we, we have essays by a leading conservative scholar and a leading progressive scholar, Nelson... And you don't have to read a lot of cases. Yeah, exactly. Yet. Nelson Lund, Adam Winkler, you can get the best arguments on both sides. You could trace uh, the state constitutional roots of the Second Amendment and the uh, gun rights around the world, all at the Interactive Constitution or download it at the App Store or Google Play. But I have to, oh, I, I have quick to, plug? Or? I have to, well, yeah, you, you can buy my book. Yeah. Uh, that's important uh, to me and my wife and my publisher. Uh, <laughs> but I, the, the, this, the Constitution Center is an important place. And I just want to, I've got a, a, a friend here uh, who, who he and his wife had come here from Italy. And 10 years ago, he came to the Constitution Center and walked out and said, I'm going to apply for citizenship now. Oh, that's great. So that's wonderful. That's an endorsement. Uh, I think he's here. Rob, stand up. <laughs> so he's an American citizen because of the Constitution Center. Well, well that's that's really, that's terrific. Thank you so much. And David Keene, thank you so much for this terrific discussion. Uh, definitely check out the book. Um, and again, happy Bill of Rights Day, everyone. And Merry Christmas. And Merry Christmas. <laughs>